Hey guys, welcome back to another something in about five minutes. Today we are tackling something that I guarantee you've heard of and I guarantee you're like still scratching your head. What the hell is that? And that is hypoxic drive. So let's get into it. Guys, I know you've heard the term hypoxic drive and I guarantee you heard this in your EMT class, your paramedic class, and they, the instructor scared you to bejesus saying, if you give oxygen to that COPD patient, you're gonna knock in their hypoxic drive and you're gonna put them right into respiratory failure and kill them. And you know what? Sure, that can happen. But guess what? That science is off of two doctors from 1949, a doctor named Dr. Davies and Dr. McKinnon in 1949. We're in 2021 now, guys, and we're still going off of science that has been altered and disproven and altered and disproven and altered and disproven over and over and over since 1949. But yet we're still learning, hey guys, you're going to kill them. And this is a big problem because it's it's one of those things where we have scared providers into treating people that are short of breath and hypoxic with oxygen and that's exactly what they need and we're going to be getting into that today so first we need to understand what the heck is a hypoxic drive so to, to know that we have to understand the two types of drives and that is a normal respiratory drive which is just we breathe to breathe off co2 carbon dioxide okay we do not breathe to breathe in oxygen take it as a moment if you if you don't know that prior to this but our bodies take in oxygen we offload co2 it's that offload of co2 and that increase in co2 levels that kicks our brain into saying hey you need to breathe to get off this co2 it's not saying hey you need oxygen breathe in that oxygen okay but when we kick in our hypoxic drive it means that our co2 levels have been chronically high for so long that our chemoreceptors within our blood and we'll get in that in the next slide our chemoreceptors that that uh deal with you know the the levels of co2 in the blood have realized that we are chronically hypercarbic or um or high co2 levels so they now switch to the hypoxic drive which says okay we know we're going to have all this co2 in our blood but now we're going to go off of breathing when we need when there's no oxygen so when we have low levels of oxygen that's going to bring us to breathe which is why people say oh my god if you give a non-rebreather mask at 25 liters and blow their face off we are now going to give them too much oxygen it's that hypoxic drive is going to get confused because it's going to go well there's no decrease in oxygen and there's too much carbon dioxide so now we don't know what to do we're just going to stop breathing altogether and that's the that is the science that people have been using since 1949 again crazy that we're still using that all right so those two chemoreceptors that you guys absolutely need to be aware of is the central chemoreceptor uh, which is located in the medulla oblongata. It manages just the neurological uh, control of the ventilatory system. So it just tells your body breathe, right? It does. It, it tells it how fast, uh, how slow. Is it rhythmic? Is it non-rhythmic? It just says breathe, right? But then you also have peripheral chemoreceptors. There's two located at the bifurcation of the carotid arteries uh, on the aortic arch. And then there's one in the descending aorta. And these more specifically monitor and manage the changes in PaO2 levels. And we're going to get into that in the next slide. So just remember that these peripheral uh, chemoreceptors are taking that information and they're saying, hey, we need to do this to the central. And then the central says, okay, breathe deeper, breathe faster, breathe slower, breathe whatever. Okay. PaO2 is the partial pressure of oxygen. It's a measurement of oxygen pressure within the arterial blood. It reflects how well oxygen is able to move between the lungs and the blood. Okay, so this is a arterial blood gas, so an ABG um, measurement. We are going to get this through uh, blood work taken at the hospital. Now, on the contrary, SAO2 is the percentage of available binding sites on the hemoglobin 
that are bound with oxygen within the arterial blood. Now, a lot of people will say, Turk, isn't this SpO2? Yes and no. So SpO2 is measured via the pulse ox, whereas SaO2 is measured via the, the arterial blood gas measurement at the hospital. So that's blood work that needs to happen to get the SaO2. So I wanted to get a couple pull quotes and the best that I found that I really liked was from EliteCME.com. Hypoxic drive is real, but its role in ventilatory failure is often overstated. As I said, we are scared into knowing we're going to give oxygen and then kill our patients, right? It is only in combination with other factors that it is a significant role in interfering with the respiratory drive. That is key to getting over this fear of a, um, you know, killing your patients, okay? Just because we give oxygen doesn't mean that we're going to put our patients into respiratory failure, even if they're a COPD or and we believe they're working off of their hypoxic drive, okay? Factors that add to, the, to sources of failure include respiratory depression drugs like narcotics and sedatives, neurological impairment, acute infections, bronchospasms, increase in work of breathing, nutritional deficiencies, an increase in metabolic demand secondary to exertion, which I think is an interesting one, and then fluid and electrolyte imbalances or other issues, okay? So if we, what they're saying here is if we have these type of issues compounding the respiratory problem and the hypoxic drive problem, that is what is going to make your patient turn from, you know, a respiratory distress into a respiratory failure. It's not solely the hypoxic drive and giving them oxygen. It's all of these other compounding problems. And that guy's here is really spelled out in this last poll quote, each on their own are not a significant factor in ventilatory failure. However, as they combine, they become synergistic. As things compound, one works now off of each other. So when this one gets worse, this one gets worse. And the compounding problem begins, right? And this is what turns your patients into having respiratory failure it's not again so much of the um the hypoxic drive on its own so how do we manage this as ems providers remember there is that magic window that we want to make sure everyone uh, falls into and that is titrating your oxygen to being effective okay we don't need everyone being at a hundred percent oxygen what we need is for them to fall in that 92 to 96 window. You'll see a lot of literature, especially with, uh, with um, hypoxic drive, COPD patients, and respiratory therapists going 88 to about 96. But EMS likes to fall in that 92 to 96 range. If we can titrate our oxygen, so taking our non-rebreathers, slapping it on, and instead of going at 25 liters and blowing their face off, we're doing you know, 10 liters and we're getting 92, 93, that is going to be effective. Remember, these patients are hypoxic. That's why they're calling us. We still need to treat the hypoxia. The only way we can treat hypoxia is twofold, increasing their oxygen by giving them oxygen or increasing the PEEP within their lungs. We can do that by either giving them uh, something with CPAP that has a PEEP valve connected to it or a BVM. But again, those are the only two ways we can increase oxygenation. We have to increase oxygenation for them to perfuse better and get rid of that hypoxia. We still might not be able to fix the hypercarbia, again, compounded because of all of these other uh, issues, but we can still fix the hypoxia and keep them from that respiratory failure problem. So guys, I hope this little explanation helps and that it's clear. Hypoxic drive is one of those things that drives me bonkers when I'm teaching my EMT students. All you have to realize is that, you know, you giving oxygen to fix the hypoxia of your COPD patient is not what is going to kill them if they have a respiratory failure type issue. It is going to be all of the other compounding problems with the hypoxic drive. And just remember, even if they fail with their respiratory drive, you can still do something by bagging your patients effectively. So till next time, guys, I will see you next Tuesday.